Do you have trouble world building or actually creating things that you feel like mesh together from characters to environments to government systems? Today, I'm going to show you Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory and how it can help you create better worlds for your games. Let's get started. Hi everybody, my name's Joe, and welcome to Tabletop Theory, where we talk about how educational and counseling theory can help you become a better storyteller. And today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite educational theories, specifically, Yuri Bronfenbrenner's Ecological Systems Theory. Now, what this is, is an organizational structure for helping people to understand how different environmental factors help affect the development of a child. Bronfenbrenner believed that everyone's environment has a direct impact on how they develop it over time. He believed that there were five different levels to everyone's own systems that they dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, what the heck does all of this have to do with you becoming a good storyteller? Bronfenbrenner's model actually helps to extrapolate how all different systems interact with each other when they relate to an individual. Now, I've used this theory to help me extrapolate different governmental policies, different religious policies, different character interactions, different histories. All of those different things are identified and isolated in the different levels of Bronfenbrenner's model. So if you understand Bronfenbrenner's model, then you can understand how to extrapolate the environment that your NPCs or your players characters might be experiencing in the game that you're trying to create. And as you understand those different ecological systems and their effect on those NPCs or those characters, then you can start to know what you need to develop as a storyteller to get a better handle on the world that you're trying to create. So let me explain. I'm going to point out that there's like a lot of notes that I wrote for this, so I might look down occasionally to try to keep everything straight. Yuri Bronfenbrenner believed that a person's development is affected by all of the systems around them. It kind of comes down to the idea of nature versus nurture. Nature being the thing that is born inside of us, these preferences that we have that aren't necessarily affected or modeled by anything around us, as opposed to nurture, which Bronfenbrenner's model seems to have a little bit more stock in, meaning that all of our external influences have a much greater influence on how we develop over time. We're going to address the idea of Bronfenbrenner's model Nurture has a much larger effect on how an individual develops. All of those systems in his model are represented by larger and larger circles, where the larger circles have effect on the smaller circles, down from the largest system, the chrono system, to the individual. The individual as a level isn't necessarily included on Bronfenbrenner's model, but I still think it's important because it isolates specific things for something like an RPG character. With an individual, there are certain things that any system won't really have a lot of influence on, and they're very small, so things like height, eye color, biological gender, all of those things are really assigned randomly to the individual and they're going to have a large amount of influence as we get larger and larger into different systems, but something like your parent's gender won't determine what your biological gender is, or something like your parent's height won't necessarily have a direct correlation to how tall you might be, but it's not going to be like, both my parents are six feet tall, so I'm going to be exactly six feet tall. So moving on to the next level, the microsystem. The microsystem has to do with all of the direct influences on an individual. In the Bronfenbrenner's model, we're talking about the individual as a child. That would be their parents, their friends that they see on a day-to-day -day basis. If we're talking about an individual who's older, their job, so the requirements of their job, their daily responsibilities. The microsystem includes all of the things that that individual is going to be dealing with every single day. The next level up is going to be called the mesosystem. The mesosystem is a collection of other microsystems, so this might not necessarily be your immediate family, but it could be your extended family. Another example of a mesosystem would be something like your friend is in your microsystem, but your friend's family is in a mesosystem. So as we expand, we're getting further away from the individual, but at the same time, we're still dealing with a collection of microsystems. And as we get to larger and larger systems, what you'll find is that each subsequent larger system is an amalgam of the system that came before it. So when we move on to the exosystem, the next model, it's an amalgamation of all of the mesosystems. Now an exosystem is larger. It represents a link between two or more settings. This could be an interaction between the college that you attend and another college that's a rival college because of sports. Or it could be how the neighborhood that you live in is maybe interacting with other neighborhoods or how those neighborhoods are organized. If the individual
individual lives in a very tightly packed urban environment or a much more sparsely populated rural environment, those different neighborhoods are going to have a different impact on something like the mesosystem, the microsystem, and then the individual. I know there's a lot of systems, but bear with me. You might consider that not necessarily the neighborhood that the individual is in, but maybe the city that they're in. So as we move past the exosystem into the macrosystem, the macrosystem is going to be a collection of different exosystems. And the macrosystem is where you start to get into things like social values, cultural values, maybe religious values, all of the different things that inform the direct moral and ethical implications that might have an effect on how an individual is raised or the different types of experiences that might be occurring for an individual as they grow up. A different example of a macro system could be an individual that is growing up inside of a war zone as opposed to an individual that's growing up in a place of relative peace and affluence. So a macro system, again, a combination of all the different exosystems that exist going back down to the mesosystems and then to the microsystems and then down to the individual. Now there's one more past the macro system and that's the chrono system. And the chrono system is how all of these different systems change over time. It's the idea that yes, they might be living in a war zone, but they weren't necessarily always living in a war zone. Their parents may not have been living in a war zone, but they're living in one now. And as the war progresses, how does that progression of battle change their upbringing, change the values around them, change how they feel like they need to act, living in a war zone when they're a child, but then living in a peaceful environment as an adult. Now that I've very non-succinctly broken down all the different levels of Bronfenbrenner's model, let me kind of give you a little bit more of an idea of how this can apply to something like creating a world or a character for your own game. And while I do that, I'm going to change the battery in my camera because it's about to die. So what in the world do all of these systems have to do with helping you to create a better, more creative world for your players and for your games? Uh, the reason's pretty simple. Bronfenbrenner's model helps to extrapolate my thoughts whenever I'm creating something new for my campaigns by giving me different guidelines for considerations. So if I'm starting to create something like a band of marauding orcs that live in the mountains, then I need to start considering all the different things about those orcs, and Bronfenbrenner's model helped me to understand how those orcs might have been raised, how those types of orcs might have changed their social models over time, maybe what type of cultural values they have and where those different things affect the different systems beyond them and before them. Because Bronfenbrenner's model is really good at asking questions about, okay, what comes next? And in a lot of cases, when I've talked to different people who've wanted to start creating worlds for their games, it's a little tricky because there's a lot of information that you have to start to create. So. Bronfenbrenner's mo- eh, really hard to say this guy's name. You're not gonna notice this because I edited it all out, but I have screwed his name up a lot. But anyway, Bronfenbrenner's model is really helpful because it gives you a chance to think in a layered fashion about the different types of influences that will come next. So let me break it down real quick another way just to sort of help you get an idea of what I'm talking about for your own game. So we're gonna talk about a character called Arnold. Arnold could be a player character or an NPC. Certain things about Arnold are determined at birth. Things like his biological gender, his height, maybe some rough appearance things. Arnold is a human, that's the individual. Moving on to the micro system. We know that both of Arnold's parents are biologically human, but for the sake of this character creation, maybe he's adopted. Maybe he's adopted by two female elves. Arnold as a character already has influence on how that would affect his upbringing with being adopted from two parents of a different ancestry that he might not necessarily have any commonalities with on a biological level, but at the same time, he's being raised in a culture where he is not necessarily the norm. Arnold and his family also worship at a specific shrine to a god, Protva. Protva in this world is the god of smiths, and both of Arnold's parents are blacksmiths. So it makes sense that due to his parents' occupations, that they have social obligations or social interactions around the religion that is expected of their parents to follow, and therefore Arnold follows it as well. So when people think of their own environments or the environment of their character that they're creating, the microsystem might be what they think of immediately, but it's not necessarily going to relate to all of the different levels as they expand, because the microsystem can't include everything. It's just the beginning of the system. Moving on to the meso 
ecosystem. Arnold's parents also get along with his friends, and Arnold's parents also have two other children, also adopted. So the different environment of Arnold's friends, his siblings' friends, his parents' friends, all have interactions on the mesosystem because, again, this is something that takes place maybe outside of his day-to-day -day life, but all of these different things in his mesosystem still have an effect on how he learns and how he grows inside of his specific environment. Now, the town that Arnold and his family live in is called Sidovar. Is Sidovar part of a mountain range? Is it in a desert? Is it in a forest? All of these different things help you to start thinking about the environment that you're going to be placing Arnold, his family, and their town into. So again, as you expand away from the individual, getting more towards the town and all of the different things the town might require to be successful, you get to start thinking about it as you start to move past just this one character. Moving from the exosystem to the macro system, that's where we start to get into the meat of what can help you to create a world. Because the macro system, we start to learn a little bit about why Arnold's there, why he's adopted. And we learn that there's a war. Okay, if there's a war, how did Arnold end up getting adopted by these two blacksmiths? He got adopted because as the war was being fought, these children were left behind near a battlefield and their parents were dead. So the elven soldiers took the human babies and brought them back to Sidovar in an effort to basically be humane. They didn't want children left on a battlefield to fend for themselves. So then Arnold's parents helped to raise them in their cultural norms of basically protva, blacksmithing, and elven heritage and lore. Because Arnold is uh, a human inside of a city of elves, he's in a minoritized population. You might have different opinions about how elves interact with humans in a minoritized way when you're dealing with elves in the majority. Are they cruel? Are they mocking? Are they accepting? Are they compassionate? So you start to see the influence of elven culture on Arnold as he's raised in that environment. Yes, he might go worship at the Shrine of Protva every day with his family, but where those religious norms come from is a part of the macro system. And then beyond that, we start to deal with the chrono system. The chrono system that made Arnold an orphan and eventually led to his adoption by these two elven women is, again, something that takes place over time. The chrono system that you can consider is maybe what started the war, what will end the war eventually, what types of other ramifications has this war caused? Has it left a lot of other people dead? Are the elves winning? Are they losing? Are they bystanders? As this war happens in the world that you've created, start to think about how those different influences can affect other individuals moving back down the chain from chrono to macro to exo to meso to micro to individual and a partridge in a pear tree because God, there are a lot of levels to this thing. But as you start to understand how they all function against each other, it gives you an opportunity to start to think about the world that you're creating in a couple of different ways that you might not have considered before. Arnold is just one person inside this universe, and he doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of influence on anything else that's going around his town. He's a child, maybe he's even just 10 years old. But everything that you just thought about as you go through Arnold and all of the different things that it took to make him help you start to ask yourself questions about the world that you're creating for your players to play around in. We started with Arnold and we ended with a war that's causing orphans and people adopting these orphans off of the battlefield. It doesn't necessarily always have to happen like that, but since you've created Sidovar the town, Protva the god, the war that caused Arnold to become an orphan, those are big benchmark items that you can then go back to and refer to while you're creating other characters. As you tick off these different levels, you're going to start to answer questions and create things for the worlds that you're trying to come up with, again, for your campaigns, for your one-shots, or whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be applied to all of your NPCs, and I highly recommend you don't do that because that's friggin' exhausting, but as you answer questions for an individual, those answers can start to have effects on the different characters and environments and places and chronologies that occur in your world. Bronfenbrenner's model is really helpful for understanding the influences that might affect a child as they develop, and they're also really helpful for helping you, a storyteller or a world builder, to understanding the influences that are at play in the world that you're messing around in. So that's all I've got for you today. Bronfenbrenner's model is a little tough to understand, at least in the outset, because of all the different layers 
layers that are attached to it, but once I got my head around it, it really helped me to start to think about world building in a completely different way, as well as starting to come up with things that I probably hadn't thought of before, as well as giving me different benchmarks that I get to hit as I'm creating more worlds and different things inside of those worlds. I hope that it's helpful for you whenever you're trying to think of ways that you might be able to answer questions about different characters and places and events in your world. If you use this model, I'd like to know, or if you do something completely different, let me know in the comments section here or on Instagram or Twitter. I really wanna know how you, the storytellers that are out there in the internet, come up with the different things that make sense for you in your world. Do you use something like Bronfen Brenner's model or do you use something completely different? Maybe you just wing it. I'm excited to know all the different ways that people use to create the worlds that they get to play in. Sleep is something that is essential to be a creative person, to help deal with stress, to help overcome anxiety and depression. Sleep is vital. And I know that in the past, I've had lots of trouble finding ways to help myself sleep. Over time, I've found that there are certain things that I've used that can help me get a good night's sleep. Sleep discipline is really important for me. Maybe about an hour before I lie down, I try to turn off all the screens so that I'm not looking at my phone, I'm not watching television, no screens, no nothing. And I found that that's been very helpful to me. Other things that I found that have been really helpful have been the use of audiobooks. Right now, I think I'm listening to uh, book five of the Wheel of Time saga, but the use of an audiobook for me to listen to as I'm falling asleep can help me to distract myself at least temporarily from any racing thoughts that I might be having that are stopping me from being able to actually fall asleep. Another thing that my wife talks about that she uses is something called the body scan method. I'll leave a link down in the description here below. And what that is is basically utilizing a combination of breathing and muscle tension to help you start at your toes, move up your legs, your hips, your torso, your arms, your neck, your head, and eventually get to the point where you have tightened and relaxed all the muscles in your body, and then eventually through the process of doing that body scan meditation, you are able to drift off and go to sleep because your mind is very focused on your ability to actually tension and release those muscles. If any of these tips are helpful or if you have other tips that you feel like would be helpful for other people to know about, leave them in the comment section here below. Thank you so much for watching. Take care, be kind, and have fun adventuring.